Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> Today we want to talk about chapter 18, storage mechanisms and control in carbohydrate metabolism. It will be in, <clears throat> in two parts. In part one, we'll talk about how glycogen is degraded and produced, and then gluconeogenesis produces glucose from pyruvate. Now, when we digest a meal high in carbohydrates, we have a supply of glucose that is exceeds our needs. So we store glucose as a polymer called glycogen. Now glycogen is similar to the starches found in plants. Uh, that's why it's sometimes called animal starch. Now in the degradation of a glycogen, several glucose molecules uh, residue can be released at the same time, one from each end of a branch rather than one at a time as it would be the case in a linear polymer. Now studies show that glycogen is optimized for its ability to store and deliver energy quickly and for the longest amount of time possible. Now, and the secret for that is optimization is the average chain length of the branches, 13 residues. Now, if the average chain length were much greater or much shorter, glycogen would not be an efficient vehicle for energy storage and release on demand. Now, glycogen is found mainly in the liver and muscle. Uh, the release of glycogen stored in the liver is triggered by low levels of glucose in the blood. <clears throat> so liver glycogen breaks down to glucose six phosphate as we see here. and then hydrolyzed to give glucose. Now, the release of glucose from the liver by this breakdown of glycogen uh, replenishes the supply of glucose in the blood. However, in muscle, however, in muscle, glucose six phosphate obtained from glycogen breakdown enters the glycolytic pathway rather than being hydrolyzed to glucose and then exported to blood stream. <clears throat> now three reactions play roles in the conversion of a glu glycogen to glucose six phosphate. Now in the first reaction, notice that here each glucose residue cleaved from glycogen reacts with phosphate to give glucose one phosphate, as you can see here. And this cleavage reaction is known as phosphorolysis rather than hydrolysis. So catalyzed by enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase. As you can see here, uh, no ATP is hydrolyzed here. Now then, glucose one phosphate is isomerized to give glucose six phosphate as you can see here catalyzed by the enzyme called phosphoglucomutase where the inorganic phosphate at anomeric carbon one is transferred to carbon number six and this is called isomerization but by mutase now complete breakdown however now, since the glycogen phosphorylase cleaves the alpha-1,4 linkages in glycogen, a complete breakdown requires an enzyme called debranching enzymes that degrade the alpha-1,6 linkages. Now, when, glyc uh, when glycogen rather than glucose is the starting material for glu glycolysis, there is a net gain of three ATP molecules for each glucose monomer rather than two ATP molecules as when glucose itself is the starting material. So we conclude that glycogen, we conclude that glycogen is a more effective energy source than glucose. Now the deep branching enzyme involves the transfer of a limited branch of three glucose residue, as you can see here, to the end of another 
branch where they are removed later by glycogen phosphorylase. Now, now the same debranching enzyme. then uh, hydrolyzes the alpha-1,6. The glycosidic bond of the last glucose residue remaining at the branch point. Now, when an organism needs energy quickly, glycogen breakdown is important. Muscle tissue can mobilize glycogen more easily than fat and can do so anaerobically. Now, with low-intensity exercise, such as jogging or long-distance running, fat is the preferred fuel. But as the intensity increases, muscle and liver glycogen becomes more important. That's why some athletes, uh, middle-aged uh, distance runners, etc., try to build up their glycogen reserves before a race. How? By eating large amounts of carbohydrates. So remember here that the debranching enzyme in its way cleaves an alpha-1,4 uh, linkage and forms a, a new alpha-1,4 linkage here in addition to uh, hydrolyzing the alpha-1,6 that is here. Now, glycogen production. How is a glycogen formed from glucose? Now, the formation of a glycogen from glucose is not the exact reversal of the breakdown of glycogen to glucose. Why? Because the synthesis uh, of a glycogen requires energy, energy which is provided by this uh, UTP. Now, in the first stage of glycogen synthesis, glucose 1-phosphate reacts with UTP to produce uridine diphosphate glucose or the so-called UDP glucose and also produces pyrophosphate, PPI. This is catalyzed by the enzyme called UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. This is the structure of the UDPG molecule, which acts as a carrier of this glucose units <coughs> so that it, uh, it is uh, and transferred to an already existing chain. Now, if we look here, the formation of UDB glucose uh, has delta G not prime of uh, zero, whereas the hydrolysis of pyrophosphate produces my uh, 7.3 kilocalorie. So what happens is that uh, these two reactions are coupled to so that the net delta G not prime is also minus 7.3 kilocalorie. So the coupling of these two exergonic reaction to a reaction that is not energetically favorable <coughs> allows an otherwise endergonic reaction to take place. <coughs> and this is the idea of metabolism is coupling, where the energy released from exergonic reaction drives endergonic one. Now, the addition of UDPG to a growing chain of glycogen is the next step in glycogen synthesis. Then UDPG is added to a growing chain of glycogen now, each step involves formation of a new alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond catalyzed by the enzyme called glycogen synthase. Now, this enzyme, this enzyme cannot simply form a bond between two isolated glucose molecules. No, it must add to an existing chain with alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages. Now, the initiation of a glycogen synthesis requires a primer now, in, at the heart of every glycogen molecule, there is a protein or enzyme called glycogenin. It, it is the primer. Since this glycogenin molecule acts as a catalyst for addition of glucose until there are about eight of them linked together. <clears throat> 
At that point, glycogen synthase takes over. Then, glycogen synthase always adds to an existing chain of at least eight glucose residual length. Now, synthesis of glycogen requires the formation of alpha-1,6 as well as alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkage. So we need the so-called branching enzyme accomplishes this task. It does so by transferring a segment of seven residues long from the end of a growing chain to a branch where it catalyzes the formation of the required alpha-1,4 glycosidic glycosidic linkage. As we see uh, here, no, no, this figure shows us the, uh, how glycogen phosphorylase adds um, a gl a one glucose uh, at an existing chain here. So UDB glucose, uh, UDB acts as a carrier of glucose that is added to a growing chain. Now, notice here then the branching enzyme, what it does. Note that this enzyme has already catalyzed the breaking of alpha-1,4 here uh, in the process of transferring the oligosaccharide segment. So breaking alpha-1,4, transferring this seven glucose uh, uh, residue long from the end of one branch to another, to form another branch. Now each transfer segment must come from a chain, this chain, at least 11 residue long. And in order to remove seven, you need this chain uh, length to be uh, 11, at least 11 yani, uh, residue long. So, and then it forms the alpha-1,6 linkage here, then U1, and uh, each new branch point must be at least four, four residues away from the nearest existing branch point. So the, the distance between the old branch and the new branch must be at least one, two, three, four uh, residue from each other, as you can see here. Now, balancing glycogen breakdown and production. How does an organism ensure that glycogen synthesis and glycogen breakdown do not operate simultaneously? Because if this were to occur, the main result would be the hydrolysis of UTP, and this would be waste of chemical energy stored in the phosphoric anhydride bond. A major controlling lies, factor lies in the behavior of glycogen phosphorylase. Now, this enzyme is not only subject to allosteric control, but also uh, it is subject to covalent modification, you remember? Uh, we saw uh, earlier an example of this kind of control in the sodium potassium pump in section 8.5. In that example, phosphorylation and dephosphorylation of an enzyme determine whether it was active and similar effect takes place where. Now, this figure summarizes some of the control features that affect glycogen phosphorylase activity. Well, she, the enzyme is a dimer, as you can see that exist in two forms, the inactive T or TOT form, as we saw in chapter seven, and the, react and the active R for relaxed form. Now in the T form, it can be modified by phosphorylation of a specific serine residue, each of the two subunits. Then phosphorylation, we need two ATP to phosphorylate the dimer at two serine residue here, to form the phosphorylated uh, enzyme. Now, this esterification reaction requires enzyme called phosphorylase kinase, and the opposite process is called dephosphorylation, 
and it requires the enzyme called phosphoprotein phosphatase. Now, the phosphorylated form of glycogen phosphorylase is called glycogen uh, is called phosphorylase A. So, it is the active one, the phosphorylated one, and the dephosphorylated one is called phosphorylase B. Now, the switch from B to A is the major form of control over the activity of phosphorylase. Now, what happens in the liver, for example, here in the liver, glucose is an allosteric inhibitor of phosphorylase A. It binds to the substrate site and favors the transition to the T state. This, uh, this shift the equilibrium to the phosphorylase B. Now, in, in muscle, however, the main allosteric effectors are ATP, AMP, and glucose 6-phosphate. Now, when the muscle uses ATP, AMP builds up. The increase in AMP stimulates formation of the R state of phosphorylase B, which is active. Now, when ATP is plentiful or glucose 6-phosphate builds up, now these molecules act as allosteric inhibitors, shifting the equilibrium back, shifting the equilibrium back to the T form. So, to summarize, we have two controls. We have the covalent modification, which is the phosphorylation, and then we have the non-covalent or allosteric control the effect of glucose, AMP, ATP, and or glucose exosphate. Not only this, in addition to that, hormonal control also enters into this picture. Hormones, when epinephrine is released from the adrenal gland in response to stress, it triggers a series of events that suppresses the activity of glycogen synthase and at the same time stimulate that of glycogen phosphorylase. Because as I said, the two enzymes cannot be active at the same time, otherwise it will be a waste of chemical energy. Now the activity of glycogen synthase is subject to the same type of covalent <clears throat> activity is subject to the same type of covalent modification as a glycogen phosphorylase, but the response is opposite. Now, the inactive form is the phosphorylated form, and the active form is the unphosphorylated form. Now, the hormonal signals, glucagon or epinephrine, stimulate the phosphorylation of glycogen synthase via an enzyme called cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase now becomes inactive after phosphorylation. At the same time, the hormonal signal is activating phosphorylase. Now glycogen phosphosynthase, the phosphorylation of this enzyme is, is more complicated in that multiple phosphorylation sites occur. As many as nine different amino acid residues have been found to be phosphorylated. Now, glycogen synthase is also under allosteric control. And it is inhibited by ATP. This inhibition can be overcome by glucose 6 phosphate, an activator. So, ATP inhibitor, glucose 6 phosphate is an activator. Now, glycogen synthase, GS, exists in two forms. The phosphorylated or inactive form, known as GSD. D means dependent, dependent on what? On high concentration of glucose 6-phosphate. Now, the non-phosphorylated or dephosphorylated is the active one known as GSI, I, yani independent for glucose 6-phosphate, 
because it is active even with low concentrations of glucose six phosphate. Now, the fact that the two target enzymes, glycogen phosphorylase and glycogen synthase, are modified in the same way by the same enzymes links the opposing processes of synthesis and breakdown of glycogen even more uh, intimately. Finally, modifying enzymes are themselves subject to covalent modification and allosteric control. And this is advantages of, to an organism. This control is advantage to the organism. Now we go, this is summary of this section. You can read it by yourself, the summary. And then we move to section two called gluconeogenesis, which is a process that produces glucose from pyruvate. Gluconeogenesis is the net synthesis of glucose from small non-carbohydrate precursors like pyruvate, lactate, glycerol, uh, amino acid called alanine. Gluconeogenesis is not the exact reversal of glycolysis. Remember that in glycolysis we have 10 reactions. Seven of them are reversible. It's okay. They are uh, the same enzymes are used in both processes, but three steps, step one, step two, and uh, step one and three and 10 are irreversible, and these uh, require new enzymes. So in order to, for gluconeogenesis to occur, we must reverse these three steps. You remember step one, step two, three and step 10. So in, if we look here at this <clears throat> figure, if we look on it to, the, to the left here from, from glucose all the way to pyruvate, this is glycolysis, which we talked about in chapter 17. Now, if we look from bottom to top, now we have gluconeogenesis. You see here uh, the blue species in the blue, green, and pink shaded boxes indicate other entry points for gluconeogenesis. For example, lactate, as I said, can be used, amino acid alanine, glycerol, enter from this point. So these are different entry points for gluconeogenesis. So let's begin this process called gluconeogenesis by reversing reaction number 10 in glycolysis. And it is the first <coughs> step. And then pyruvate is carboxylated to oxaloacetate. This requires energy in the form of ATP. catalyzed by the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase. Uh, this enzyme is activated by acetyl-CoA, an allosteric vector, and require, requires a biotin coenzyme. This biotin is a CO2 carrier in addition to a metal ion Mg plus two. So all of these are required. Uh, for this first step, Pyruvate is carboxylated to form oxaloacetate. This is in step one. Remember to synthesize one glucose, we, we must start with two pyruvate. So here two, two ATP are required and two oxaloacetate are produced. Now, as I said that all carboxylation reactions require biotin. And here you see the, the structure of biotin and its mode of attachment. This enzyme is pyruvate carboxylase. It has a lysine residue and it forms an amide bond with, uh, with, with the carboxyl group of biotin and the epsilon amino group of uh, lysine residue. 
So biotin, a carrier of carbon dioxide, remember. Now, uh, the CO2 is attached to the biotin, which in turn is covalently bonded to the enzyme, and then the CO2 is shifted to pyruvate to form oxaloacetate. As يعني, we see in this mechanism, note that ATP is required for this reaction. So here you can see the mechanism. Look here how uh, biotin is a carrier of CO2 and then biotin transfer this to pyruvate to generate uh, oxaloacetate, the product, as you can see here. Now, the conversion of oxaloacetate in the next step to phosphoenol pyruvate is catalyzed by the enzyme called uh, phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase or اختصارا يعني, PEPCK which is found in the mitochondria and the cytosol. Notice here oxaloacetate requires uh, the reaction involves hydrolysis of GTP rather than ATP but these GTP and ATP are equivalent. Oxaloacetate requires Mg plus 2 and the enzyme PEPCK to produce phosphoenol pyruvate that CO2. So here uh, we have in step 1 carboxylation and in step 2 decarboxylation. Now the successive carboxylation and decarboxylation reactions are both close to equilibrium. Now once this oxaloacetate that, if we go back here, this oxaloacetate that is formed in mitochondria can have two fates with respect to gluconeogenesis. What are these fates? Then, it can continue to form PIP, I, oh, the first fate can continue to form PIP, which can then leave the mitochondria via a specific transporter to continue gluconeogenesis in the cytosol. This is one fit. Now the other possibility is that the oxaloacetate uh, can be turned into malate via mitochondrial malate dehydrogenase, a reaction that uses an ADH. As we will see in, in the next figure, malate can then leave the mitochondria and have the reaction reversed by cytosolic malate dehydrogenase. Now, the reason for this two-step process is that oxaloacetate cannot leave the mitochondria, but malate can. Because the mitochondrial membrane is impermeable to oxaloacetate. Now, you might wonder why these two paths exist to get PEP into the cytosol to continue gluconeogenesis. The answer is brings us back to the familiar enzyme we saw in glycolysis, glycerol dehydrophosphate dehydrogenase. Remember in chapter 17, you know, the, the purpose of lactate dehydrogenase to reduce pyruvate to lactate so that NADH would be oxidized to form NAD plus, which is needed to continue glycolysis. So this reaction must be reversed in gluconeogenesis and the cytosol has a low ratio of NADH to NAD+. So the purpose of this uh, round out a way of, of getting oxaloacetate out of the mitochondria via malate dehydrogenase is to produce NADH in the cytosol so that gluconeogenesis can continue. Then the figure you see here is uh, the mechanism by which oxaloacetate comes out of the mitochondria to the cytosol. Uh, this is called a compartmentalized reaction. Our pyruvate is converted to oxaloacetate in the mitochondria. 
and then oxaloacetate cannot be transported across the mitochondrial membrane. It must be reduced to malate by NADH, and then malate, uh, malate is transported to the cytosol and then oxidized by this oxidizing agent NAD plus back to oxaloacetate to form NADH and oxaloacetate is now ready for gluconeogenesis.